All right, good afternoon. So first, before I get started, I just want to thank the Mulgrave team, and especially Michael and David, for all of the effort they've put into hosting this event. So over a decade ago, myself and a friend traveled to Sub-Saharan Africa. We went to Zambia. We went with a large international nonprofit that was dedicated to building houses, providing access to social services, and doing good in the global south. Now, a close friend of mine, he approached me about the trip, talking about how it was good intentions, how we could do so much positive for the global south, and also the schedules really lined up well. It was after we had finished school and before we had started work. So without further ado, we booked tickets to travel to Zambia. Now, I distinctly recall speaking to my parents, having to explain to them that Zambia is an independent country located in southern Africa, not a part of South Africa. So we fast forward a couple of months, and we're at the project site. It's about four and a half hours commute from the capital city. I'm with a group of around 15 to 16 volunteers, many of whom are from Canada, the United States, Western Europe, and similar. Now, this experience definitely wasn't exactly what I had fully expected. About halfway into the project, our, our team lead, who is from the States, she had been on a number of international projects before, specifically with this organization. And initially, it gave me comfort knowing that she had been to Zambia on a number of occasions. But about halfway through the project, she got into a bit of a dispute with the local contractor, the Zambian who had been hired to oversee the build project and to ensure that things were going as they should. I remember one of my colleagues approached our team lead and asked, who are we to be taking directions from? Who do we listen to? Our team lead replied, well, this is my eighth project, as if to suggest that her experiences volunteering in this country were somehow more valid and gave her the credibility to tell us what to do as opposed to the local who dedicated his life to this line of work. This was my first, but certainly not my only, concern with regards to what the project was doing, who it was really for, and what we were accomplishing. Now, this was my first interaction with the growing volunteer tourism sector, but it certainly wasn't my last. So what is volunteer tourism? It's one of the fastest growing industries within international travel. It's massive. As of 2019, it's estimated that it's worth over $173 billion. It's a rapidly growing industry. And more often than not, volunteer tourism projects are marketed to young people, to youth, who want to do good and give back. And in many cases, these projects undertake what's considered to be, or at least marketed to be, low skill. Things like building classrooms, building houses, volunteering with children, playing games. It's a billion and billions of dollars industry. It's massive. It's a money-making industry. It's really, really big. And volunteer tourism is, is something that we need to analyze and dissect further. So fast forward a year and a half later, and I'm studying international development here in Vancouver, getting my graduate degree in the field at Simon Fraser University. And I earned a grant through the Canadian government to travel abroad. I went back to sub-Saharan Africa, and in this case, I was in Uganda, conducting research as a part of my graduate studies. So I'd arrived in country in the fall of 2010, and I was based in a small community that was outside of one of Uganda's second cities. It was approximately four five, to five hours' drive from the capital. Now, while I was there, I recognized that this community didn't receive a lot of international travelers. that didn't have a large expat community but it had a growing number of short-term volunteer tourism trips that kept coming to communities nearby. I remember distinctly, I think it was in late October, that I met a group from the United States who came with the best of intentions here to build schools. And this is exactly what this industry is all about, young people wanting to give back and doing their absolute best, similarly to when I first traveled to the Global South. Now, halfway into their project, I noticed that they hadn't really been keeping up with what they thought the pace was going to be. The project was a little bit behind schedule, and it's because the group had recognized they were under-equipped, ill-prepared, and really didn't have the skill sets necessary and able to do difficult tasks. I thought this was an interesting concept, given they had flown from the other side of the planet to participate in this project. 
But given that this wasn't my first experience witnessing and being a part of volunteer tourism, it wasn't an entirely foreign concept to me. Now, I remember when I was living in this community in Uganda, I had developed quite a number of friendships, and we would often play basketball after done for the day. And I'd speak to them and ask them, okay, so what is this group doing here? What is happening? Why do you guys keep seeing a rise in volunteer tourists? And more often than not, the friendships that I had developed, they couldn't tell me really what was happening. There was a clear disconnect between what they were talking about and what the group that had come all the way around the world was here to do. They would tell me that they didn't know what they were accomplishing, what the purpose was, who they were helping, and the like. Now, the Global South has a litany of volunteer short-term projects all over the place. Things like building classrooms, building schools, digging wells, volunteering with children, playing sports. It's a large industry, and large swaths of Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia, you can find poorly built, half-complete, unused projects that really are not having a positive, lasting impact. A simple Google search, rather, let alone a rigorous academic study, will indicate how many of these projects are, are poorly planned out and poorly executed. And it begs us to ask some questions. Well, who are these for, and why is it happening? So if we take this concept of building schools, it's, a, it's rather straightforward. This idea that if we build rooms, spaces where students can come and learn, they are going to be better off for it. But it's really important for us to stand, understand that schools are just a place. A school is a building. It can be made up of multiple classrooms, or even just one. Or it can just be a simple meeting, meeting space where people come to learn. But education is an extremely complex system that requires inputs, outputs, and so much more in order to function effectively. Education and schools are not the same concept, but it's easy to market and sell because we all have experiences with education. Imagine if all of us decided that we were going to go to the Global South and that we were going to build classrooms and that we were going to build a school. But what happens if we didn't have a rigorous plan with regards to who is going to teach there, what they were going to be teaching, and what materials were going to be used? Well, we could only imagine the quality of education that those young people would be receiving if we didn't think about the entire complex process. So that begs us to dive into a few more of these critical questions to understand what's going on here. So I'm going to start with three. So let's, let's analyze question one. Who is this for and why is it happening in the first place? Well, if you were to ask me before I traveled to Zambia, similarly to have if you'd asked the group that went to Uganda, why were we going and who were we going for, I would have told you stories of altruism, giving back, doing good, supporting communities in the global south that I thought needed it the most. I, however, have come to recognize and realize that if I were as altruistic as I thought I was, I should have been willing to put in the time, the effort, and the energy to do the research necessary in order to understand what I was doing and who was I doing it for. I thought I'd had the best of intentions. I wanted to do good and give back but I wasn't willing to take the time and the effort to understand how complex these social issues are and how these communities, it's, it's extremely difficult for us to understand how we can have a positive impact in these communities. Now, I often speak to young people, and, and I spend a lot of time in the Global South, be it in Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, and I, and I meet well-intended youth, just like myself over a decade ago, and I ask them, who are you doing this for and why? Sometimes I get responses around, this is going to improve my CV. It's going to help me get into the undergraduate school of my choice. And this is a somewhat complex, uh, it's, it's complex to understand how two weeks of skills and experiences is somehow going to make you a fully well-rounded candidate to get into the university of your choosing. This is especially confusing when universities themselves pride themselves on higher learning critical thought, reflection, and doing the research necessary to get it right. So, it's important for us to start with question number one. Who are we doing this for? Why? 
And if we start to recognize that actually this trip is more for myself than it is for the community I'm wanting to support, then we need to reevaluate this industry and what exactly the projects look like as we're doing them. So that's question one. Question two, are you skilled? If you're going abroad to build classrooms, do you have a background in carpentry or masonry? If you're going to volunteer with vulnerable youth, do you have a background in social work? Can you do these things in your home country? If you cannot, should you be doing it anywhere at all? And of course, it's, it's difficult for us to ask these tough questions of young people because we know they don't have these backgrounds. But this industry targets youth for these specific reasons. I, it's, it's important for us to understand that sometimes I hear tales of, well, if the volunteers hadn't come, then the money for the projects that they were doing wouldn't have shown up either. I find this problematic, simply because you have the money and the resources to go and to do this doesn't give you the right to intervene in the complex issues that are facing many in the Global South. So if you don't have the skills to do the work, we should be re-evaluating whether or not that work should be happening at all. So question two, are you skilled? Do you have a background in this space? And question three, what's the impact? If you were to ask me what my impact was in Zambia, could I tell you? The answer is no. I can't. I could have told you stories about how many rooms and houses that we were intending to build. And similarly, similarly, the number of youth that I've met who've told me the impact is measured based on the number of classrooms they've produced. I always ask, okay, so what is the long-term impact of the presence of those classrooms? Knowing that I'm probably not going to get a fully detailed response because expecting them to know that is extremely challenging. So it's met with confusion and sometimes silence. I now recognize that one of the most driving factors behind my trip to the Global South in the first place was this extremely dangerous narrative called the white savior complex. This idea that I can go and solve people's problems without fully comprehending them, it's a sort of post-colonial guilt that's been embedded into our society through large organizations that build their business model on this. It's important for us to understand that volunteer tourism traces its roots to colonialism and the post-colonial era. Housing and education, these are really complex social issues. We could talk about so many others, volunteering with youth. Another one that comes up very frequently is access to clean drinking water and digging wells. But if digging wells and building classrooms if providing the infrastructure for those projects single-handedly address these issues, these challenges wouldn't present themselves at all anymore. So what is your impact, and how do we measure that, and how do we know? Now, I'm not just only going to talk about the criticisms, I want to talk about some alternatives as well, because I do want you to understand that I'm not against volunteering. Volunteering can be meaningful and impactful, but when it comes to volunteer tourism, we need to be willing to question and answer all of this. We need to be willing to tackle these issues because we're talking about very complex issues. And if you want to travel abroad to the Global South, I highly encourage you to do it. There's so much you can get out of experiencing what communities and countries have to offer. But when you go there, consider hiring local companies to take you on tours, on safaris, on guides. Go to markets, interact with vendors who've made the products that they're selling, ask them questions, learn from them. Travel to learn. Education and travel go hand in hand. You can learn so much from traveling if you are willing to expose yourself to so much that's going on. Now, if you want to have an impact at home, that's fantastic. There are ways you can do that too. There are thousands of great organizations who are doing meaningful work that could always use more contributions. And we have an election coming up in this country. Take the time to do the research to check out which parties align themselves with reducing global inequalities in a sustainable method. And for the youth in the room, when you can vote, please take that into consideration because it's really, really important to do so. So I want to leave you with one closing thought. We spend years of our lives 
before we go off into the working world to learn. We spend a minimum of 13 getting an education, and many of us four more years afterwards, and some of us two and even more after that. It's our system of modern education. It's ingrained into us to learn before we go out and pursue a career and do things beyond the confines of the classroom. The idea, however, that within the matter of two weeks, you can have a lasting and sustainable impact on a community that you don't have any connections to, that you don't fully comprehend, and you're uncertain of what the impact of your presence is really going to be, well, it's a confusing concept given we've been told our entire lives that before you go off and do things, you really need to learn about them first. So the next time you're considering volunteering abroad, or someone in your network talks about it, ask them these questions, have these meaningful discussions. The perils of volunteer tourism are well documented. I am certainly not the first person to speak about this, and given the growth of the industry, I'm not going to be the last. Over the past five years, I've dedicated my life now to building opportunities for youth to engage in more ethical and meaningful ways in the Global South. I encourage you to ask these tough questions, to reflect on these, ask them, have serious conversations about this. Reflect on why important and how, well, reflect on how important it is to have these discussions now, unlike I was willing to do before I first traveled to the Global South. Thank you.